hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the, today's seminar. We are so happy to have Vihal, who is very well known for his work actually on, uh, on hydronomization in strongly interacting theories uh, with applications to quark gluon plasma. He has done a lot of work there. He's also one of the pioneers of finding this hydronomic attractors, but he has also worked very much on the on quantum complexity and uh, related topics. And uh, what he's today going to do, he's going to present his latest work on, on, on in that direction, uh, of, about which we are all excited about. So Mihal, we are over to you then to tell you to tell us about your latest work. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Ian, for your kind introduction and uh, the invitation to speak in this series. Uh, I'm a big fan myself of virtual seminars. I think they uh, actually take little effort to organize in my experience and uh, provide so much uh, in return. Uh, so, I mean, otherwise uh, I would not be able to visit India at that time, uh, but now you can, you can all be here and, and hear me. Um, I'm very excited to tell you some bits uh, today about uh, a paper that appeared in January uh, this year, written together with uh, Ramesh Chandra, who is a PhD student of Jan de Boer, both of whom are at the University of Amsterdam, Mario Flori, uh, who is in the audience and uh, resides in Madrid, um, as well as Sergio Hortner and Andy Rolf, who are both postdocs in Amsterdam. Uh, and the title of my talk is uh, Space Time as a Quantum Circuit. Um, so, um, I actually, uh, not sure, uh, what the audience, uh, really is. So I will try to make this talk as pedagogical as possible and try to focus on things that I think are essential and try to skip the things that I find as, uh, super deeper, uh, technical details. And, uh, if you have any questions, uh, I will be happy to give it a try and, and answer, uh, them. Um, so, of course, I'm, I'm going to assume that uh, everybody who's in the audience is familiar uh, one way or the other with holography, ADS-CFT, and one of the dominant themes in ADS-CFT of the past, uh, say, 15 years uh, is uh, entanglement entropy, which, um, due to Ryu and Takanagi, uh, we view on the gravitational side as a Bekenstein-Hawking entropy of certain co-dimension two surfaces. And I would not be uh, giving this talk if uh, it did not turn out that uh, this uh, powerful idea uh, provided us uh, with uh, a genuinely new quantitative tool for uh, quantum gravitational uh, research. So uh, let me um, present this uh, in um, some more details. So here I'm depicting for you the uh, ADS, uh, empty ADS geometry. Uh, for definiteness, you can think of it as uh, empty ADS3 geometry, and indeed in the rest of my talk, I will be focusing primarily on ADS3 CFT2. Um, so this is the geometry. Uh, on this, this geometry has an asymptotic boundary, so like this is the, basically the boundary of the cylinder. Um, and when you pick a time slice on this asymptotic boundary, so like this is this uh, dashed uh, circle, uh, this time slice uh, defines for you a state in a dual CFT2. Uh, in this case, it's the vacuum state. Um, and if you think about the CFT living, uh, as living on a circle as drawn here, or, uh, well, I mean, let's focus on the circle for the moment. And you, on this circle, you look at uh, division or bipartition of the circle into two parts, one being the interval A and the other one being the complement interval A bar. Um, if you uh, consider reduced density matrix uh, defined in uh, the interval A, uh, and you calculate its fundamental entropy, it turns out, and this is the, um, this is the proposal by Yu and Takanagi, that uh, this, this, this quantity, the entanglement entropy, uh, is given by uh, the area of the, basically of the minimal uh, co-dimension to surface that is spanned uh, by, this, by this interval on the boundary. So this is this magenta, this magenta uh, region over here. So, um, I mean, it's a, it's a very powerful idea because uh, entanglement, entropy, entanglement and its entropy has been one of the dominant uh, tools in uh, quantum information science. Let me just drop it because uh, this is uh, unnecessary. 
uh, it's it's a dominant tool in quantum information science and quantum computing. And as a result, uh, the fact that entanglement entropy um, acquires such a um, simple realization uh, in ADS-CFT allows to import uh, many of these ideas from quantum information science, quantum computing into the gravity side of ADS-CFT and uh, learn something about quantum gravity. So uh, in my talk, I will be going in this direction. And um, basically, a lot of the things that have been understood using Drew Takanagi uh, proposal, using entanglement entropy, um, is uh, by uh, thinking about ADS spacetime as sort of woven uh, by Rita Kanagi surfaces. So in particular, uh, if you look at um, the constant time slice of this anti-distor spacetime, then you can think of, um, you, can, you, can, you can basically see that through any point on this constant time slice, there's gonna be infinitely many Rita Kanagi sur surfaces passing by, right? And you can think of, you know, like this whole time slice as uh, basically woven from uh, such uh, surfaces. And similarly, you know, we can consider boosted time slices. And in this way, you can think of reproducing, you know, uh, at least parts of the bulk space times from the entanglement properties of uh, states in dual quantum field theory. And when one does it, uh, what happens is then one effectively keeps uh, the global state fixed. So for example, when I consider here this time slice, uh, we fix the global state to be the vacuum, uh, and what one varies are subregions. So, like in this case, what one does is one takes these two points that define the the subregion A, and as a result, also define the Rita Kanagi surface being this magenta uh, segment, um, and one varies them uh, perhaps like uh, through all the positions along this uh, constant time slice. Um, and when one adopts this perspective that uh, goes uh, broadly under the name of uh, the kinematic space that uh, originates from papers uh, in 2015 and 2016 by uh, Bartek Chah and collaborators, as well as uh, in a paper that I've written together with uh, Jan de Boer, uh, um, Felix Hell, and Rob Myers around the same time. Um, in this, in this spirit, uh, one can think of uh, at least part of the bulk as encoded in some scalar function, I mean, in this case, entanglement entropy, that is defined on a moduli space of subregions in a dual safety. And um, as I already anticipated in two boundary dimensions, so ADS3 so CFT2 correspondence, uh, connected subregions in quantum fields here are defined by pairs of points. Um, and uh, this uh, observation uh, basically, um, sorry, basically leads us to conclude that um, it's, it's going to be natural to assign to this moduli space of points a metric. Uh, this metric is going to be basically uh, a metric on the coset space that is defined as a coset of the, you know, the, the part of the global uh, conformal group that preserves the time slice, right, because you want to reside on a time slice. Uh, uh, over a group that uh, you know preserves basically the pair of points that we are after, and it turns out that when you construct such a coset geometry, uh, it turns out that this coset geometry is nothing else than a two-dimensional visitor space, right? So when you look at a constant time slice uh, in um, ADS uh, three space times, you can view it as a hyperbolic disk. I mean, like as it's drawn here. Or alternatively, you can, you can say that through every point on this uh, constant time slice, there's going to be infinitely many Rita Kanagi surfaces uh, passing by, and that information about this constant time slice is actually encoded, uh, in this case equivalently, uh, in uh, a geometry that goes under the name of the uh, kinematic space uh, that, uh, in this case, is going to be a two-dimensional visitor space. And I'm not saying this in vain because this two-dimensional decitor space is going to reappear later uh, in my talk uh, in some twist of the story of uh, circuits and uh, gravity. So this is the part about the entanglement. Uh, yes, uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. In, in this uh, story, uh, you're, you're just talking out here of the vacuum uh, or some static state, right? Uh, some so, static solution. So, so, oh, so in the end, like, yeah, sorry, please finish your question. That's what you finished. No, sorry, I'm, I'm done. Okay. Uh, yeah, so as I said, like, like the idea here is that one fixes a state 
And in this particular state, one looks at um, uh, you know all possible uh, subregions that define for you um, the 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 the, the Ruta Kanagi surfaces, right? The moduli space of subregions is infinitely dimensional. However, in conformal field theory, it's very natural to look at uh, in two dimensions like pairs of uh, points. Um, um, in higher number dimensions, it's going to be spheres. Um, and um, this you can always do when you keep the state fixed. However, um, the situation is more uh, complicated uh, when you consider states other than the vacuum, right? Because uh, part of the allure of um, of um, of this the sitter uh, geometry as a kinematic space geometry um, comes from the fact that uh, the vacuum is preserved by global uh, conformal transformations, and other states uh, need not to be preserved. And as a result, this geometry uh, is not going to be necessarily relevant for considering a uh, majority of excited states. So yeah, so the situation when you have uh, more complicated states uh, is going to be uh, more complicated. However, uh, for the rest of my talk, I will be focusing on the vacuum ADS3 geometry. And as a result, uh, the, this complication is not uh, going to uh, matter much. Yeah, but uh, just a basic question. So to understand this kinematic space, is it important that all the geodesics lie on some time slice, fixed time slice? Uh, good. So uh, it's not uh, that crucial. I mean, like, this is going to be the situation that I will consider. So I don't worry about the marginal case. But you can do a more. So, you know, like over here, I said, you know, you fix, sorry, you fix um, a time slice. And on a time slice, you consider a Ryuta Kanagi um, uh, surface, right? But you can consider uh, also variations of a time slice. And then you can construct the um, corresponding uh, moduli space of uh, subregions. And it turns out that this modular space of subregions is going to be actually a product of two sitter space. And more generally, uh, it's going to be a more complicated space. So it's not. I know, in, sorry. In, I, no, I was not asking not, that. So no, I, I'm not asking that. I was saying that if you take the time slice on the boundary, uh, but the geodesics may not all uh, span some time slice in the bulk, no? In general, yeah. you should you have to take extremal. In this specific case, it is because of, uh, of the, of, because it's a static geometry. Uh, but if you have, in generally speaking, uh, the geodesics may not lie on the same time slice in which the boundary, uh, in which the boundary is lying. I mean, these are boundary anchor geometries, the geodesics. So they're always going to, on the boundary, lie on a time slice that you pick. However, that's true that uh, in time dependent cases, uh, you might wonder like if there is a canonical time slice to pick. And I would say that the answer probably is not. Um, yeah, that's, and uh, that's even if you come up with some answer, like these geodesics are not going to, not all of them are going to lie along uh, a particular one. So, so yeah, I mean, that's correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, I'm like just just to be said, like this program is the most successful in the case of static geometries, in the case of empty ADS geometries, and this is going to be the geometry that we're going to be dealing with. So uh, all these complications, while important, are not going to be relevant for the discussion. So if you want, we can come back to this topic later. Uh, but for now, I think uh, we can move on. So. So one thing that 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 I want to emphasize is that uh, entanglement entropy, um, as it is, is a codimension two uh, proxy of uh, holographic spacetime. And uh, while in empty ADS geometry, uh, through any point, uh, there's going to be infinitely many um, uh, Rita Kanagi surfaces passing by. Uh, there are geometries, in particular black hole geometries and interior of black hole geometries, where there are at least some points through which no uh, Ryuta Kanagi surface uh, passes. And as a result, like this led to a slogan uh, by Lenny Saskin that entanglement is not enough. And that uh, led to um, a flurry of activity in understanding uh, proxies of bulk that are not codimension two as uh, Ryuta Kanagi surfaces, uh, but actually codimension one or zero. Um, and uh, basically, this uh, goes under the name of uh, holographic complexity proposals. 
Uh, in my talk for simplicity, uh, I will uh, focus exclusively on one of these uh, holographic complexity proposals that goes under the name of complexity equals the volume. And the idea is that uh, we uh, pick a time slice on the boundary of uh, ADS. This time slice, as I said earlier, defines for us a state. And instead of uh, looking at you know, subregions uh, in the state, what we're going to be constructing uh, is uh, our co-dimension one bulk surfaces that are spanned by this boundary time slice, right? There's going to be infinitely many such uh, co-dimension one bulk surfaces. However, uh, if one imposes the condition that such surfaces has uh, an extreme, they have an extreme bulk volume, then that specifies a unique one. Uh, in the case of Lorentzian spacetime, that's going to be the condition that the volume is maximal. Uh, in the case of a Euclidean ADS spacetime, the condition is that the volume is minimal, right? So uh, viewed from uh, this perspective, uh, this, this orange uh, surface uh, is nothing else than an interesting uh, covariant uh, bulk observable, covariant gra gravitational quantity um, that, uh, you know, reflects some features of the state that is defined by the constant time slice on the boundary on which it is anchored. Um, and what's important to note is that such co-dimension one objects, uh, they have this attractive feature that they um, a probe, uh, I'm not sure if always, but at least in some cases of interest, beyond the regions where entanglement uh, entropy cannot uh, penetrate. So inside the regions that entanglement entropy cannot penetrate. And that's uh, why such objects can be of interest from the point of view of bulk reconstruction that is understanding um, local properties of um, in, in asymptotically ADS geometries from the point of view of uh, quantum field theory quantities. Now, um, I, will, I will try to be much more specific about it later. Uh, however, um, one of the uh, most important impetus for interest as well as uh, physical interpretation of such uh, surf co dimension one surfaces comes from a uh, conjectured relation between tensor networks and uh, hyperbolic disks, right? So in 2009, uh, Brian Swingle um, uh, conjectured that uh, geometry of a constant time slice of ADS, uh, which uh, is one of these uh, volumes that I uh, consider, um, is uh, a gravity representation of uh, multi-scale entanglement renormalization ansatz. And I don't really want to well into details of what uh, this MERA uh, is, uh, but what I want to say is that um, it's some um, uh, quantity that is uh, written as a contraction of tensors, and now uh, if you count the total number of tensors, uh, then the total number of tensors under the, um, under the, the conjecture correspondence between tensor networks and holography would be nothing else than uh, the volume, right? So if you were to say that this MERA is optimal from some point of view, then uh, that would provide an indication that actually the volume um, uh, measures uh, basically um, the hard, the, the volume expresses uh, the hardness of state preparation using limited resources in underlying quantum field theory. So uh, this is not really uh, fully robust because it's a, it's a conjecture. I mean, a holographic complexity proposal is a conjecture that is based on another conjecture, which is the, uh, partly based on another conjecture, which is a conjecture uh, of uh, gravitational interpretation of tensor networks. Uh, however, uh, both topics are reasonable. I mean, both conjectures are reasonable, and uh, both have uh, you know additional um, um, cross checks or additional properties that make them attractive one way uh, or the other. So um, in my talk, uh, what I want to do is I want to provide uh, what possibly is a, is a better perspective on um, thinking about this constant time slice uh, in uh, ADS3 as a state preparation uh, in underlying uh, conformal field theory. And uh, I hope that uh, as my talk progresses, it's going to be clear uh, what I have in mind. Any questions about this? Okay, so let me pr proceed. So um, 
so the, the holographic complexity proposals conjecture that uh, the volume of uh, such, a, in particular, such a time slice corresponds to hardness of state preparation using limited resources. And uh, around uh, year 2017, so about three years after uh, they were introduced to the literature, um, I started thinking uh, in parallel with uh, Rob Myers and uh, Ro uh, Jefferson um, about um, how to define uh, hardness of state preparation uh, in uh, quantum field theory, right? Because if uh, volumes uh, correspond to hardness of state preparation in dual quantum field theories, then um, in principle, you should be able to define it in a dual quantum field theory um, and, um, and try to derive in this way holographic complexity proposals, right? And um, it turns out that uh, it's possible, and this is the subject of um, the paper that I've written with Shira Chapman and Hugo Marocchio and uh, Fernando Pastaski in 2017 in parallel with a paper that Rob Myers and Rob Jefferson wrote uh, at uh, the same time. And um, in order to present to you like what's the idea and what's the scheme that's gonna uh, uh, reappear later uh, in uh, my talk, uh, let me start with a simple example. And the simple example is gonna be example of uh, a single, uh, you know, a spin degree of freedom um, in physical, I mean, in our uh, world. So this is an example that I really like, uh, and I've been using it to present some of the features of uh, this quantity complexity. Uh, and it turns out that uh, now two years ago, uh, Brown and Saskind even uh, wrote uh, a whole paper about this particular example. So if you're interested in understanding it a bit better, uh, you're um, uh, by all means uh, encouraged to look into their paper. So, so the idea is that we, we are after uh, preparing uh, some state uh, in the context of uh, holography. The state uh, is going to be the vacuum state of uh, conformal field theory, right? So we're going to call the state that we want to prepare a target state. And uh, we want to obtain the target state starting from some other state that I'm gonna call a reference state. So we have a target state, a reference state. And now uh, in this example, uh, we're gonna be considering uh, unitary transformations that take us, takes us from this reference state to a target state. And then we're gonna consider all the unitary transformations that take us uh, between these two states and uh, minimize some quantity and claim uh, the optimal transformation. That's basically the idea. So imagine that uh, the target state that uh, one considers the, is a state in which the spin is pointing along the z direction, and the reference state is a spin is a spin pointing along the x direction, right? So this is the situation that uh, we encounter, and operations that we can use are poly matrices. So we can exponentially poly matrices, and in this way we can generate rotation and rotate uh, the reference state into the target state. So if you were asked me to do this, I mean, like the first thing that would come to my mind would be to rotate, say, um, uh, the spin pointing along the x direction along the uh, y axis by pi half in such a way that it's gonna point along the z direction and the job is done. Uh, so that's certainly one possibility. Uh, the other possibility would be to first rotate the spin uh, pointing along the x direction to point along the y direction and later uh, pointing as it points along the y direction, rotate it, um, you know, to point along the z direction, and the job is done. And now, um, when you look at these operations, you can ask how to assign a cost to them, how to say if one is more cheap or more expensive. And when you look at uh, these transformations, these transformations are generated by the by generators, so in this case, poly matrices. And these poly matrices are generated with some angles, right? And it's then natural to think about this angle as um, basically number of times you apply a given transformation, right? So in this case, when we just use a single poly matrix, uh, the cost, uh, you would expect it to be related to the angle pi half by which you rotated. In the other case, the cost, well, you, you did actually two rotations, right? So the cost uh, that uh, you expect to, to, um, to, 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 to be uh, is, uh, you know, like 
the sum of like this angle and the sum of this angle. And maybe you would say that this one is more expensive than that one, right? Because over here you have to rotate by pi half, and over here you have to rotate by pi half plus pi half. Right? That 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 would be the naive intuition. However, I mean nobody really told you uh, that the cost of uh, all rotations is the same, and it might be that the cost of the uh, rotation along the y direction, so like the one that performs the job here, is ten times bigger than the cost of the remaining rotation. And in this case, actually, uh, it turns out that uh, the, the rotation that, uh, in the, the transformation that involves two rotations is actually cheaper than, uh, than this one. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that um, in this, the, 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 a very nice way to, to, to define complexity for in, in the setting of quantum field theory uh, comes from basically considering uh, a group of transformations that is, that is generated by some algebra and then uh, basically assign a cost to application of um, you know each uh, each uh, basically each generator of the algebra. This is what I'm this is what I'm saying. And this approach, uh, although here uh, is uh, demonstrated on an example of a single spin, uh, naturally uh, generalizes to quantum field theories. Um, and it's been devised in the context of uh, quantum computations so spin systems uh, in a pioneering work in 2005, so 16 years ago, by Michael Nielsen, Nielsen of uh, the textbook on uh, quantum uh, information science. So to, do, to this end, like instead of thinking about you know discrete you know uh, finite discrete transformations, you're going to be thinking about the circuit. So there's a unitary circuit that. Um, uh, has a circuit parameter, let's call it tau, um, and uh, the, the instantaneous operator that uh, generates the circuit is decomposed into gates. In this case, these uh, gates uh, are going to be uh, sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. And now each of these gates is applied with some, um, some infinitesimal number of times that's going to be basically given by d tau times this epsilon. And now, if you were to count the total number of gates, what we would do is basically we would uh, see how many um, how many times epsilon uh, has been invoked, and we can basically do this by you know uh, integrating over the whole circuit and then taking the absolute value of epsilon because it doesn't really matter for us if uh, you know we rotate by an angle that is you know plus uh, pi or minus pi, and then. Uh, there's going to be as many epsilons as generators, so here in this case three, uh, and each generator can come with uh, what is called its own penalty factor. So, for example, in this situation, the penalty factor was uh, 10 for uh, the y rotation and 1 and 1 for uh, the x and z rotation, right? So, like that, that will be the example of the cost that is governed by something that looks like an L1 norm. And now, if you want to and this, so this is the cost for every realization of the transformation from a reference state to the target state. And now complexity is going to be the minimum of this cost. Uh, so what you're supposed to do is to consider all transformations between ref reference target state, uh, evaluate cost for each single one of them, and pick the minimum, right? That's roughly speaking the idea. Um, can I, yes. Can I ask something? Uh, so, of uh, so, uh, so your this cost function is some sort of a norm in the space of unitary operators. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but is it? Uh, it's not necessarily a metric norm, like the first one that you just mentioned, or is it? Uh, uh, what exactly mathematically it is? So uh, well, I mean, I would say that it's like uh, what, what I'm doing is here. I'm I'm assigning a an a norm. I mean, like I'm providing an example of an L1 norm. You can do L2. You can do some more exotic things. And then you can basically what you do is like you assign a, a geometry to this space of circuits, but this geometry is going to be a standard Riemannian geometry only if you use an L2 norm. And otherwise, I guess it goes under the name of the Sinsler geometry. So in the end, like the idea is that the the problem of finding optimal circuits reduces to a problem of finding geodesics uh, in some auxiliary geometry. And when I say this, I mean, I don't have in mind ADS geometry, but some geometry of circuits or so something that, uh, you know, is like high level mathematical entity. So, so basically you have to satisfy some function, some, some mathematics, like if it is U1 and U2, then U1, U2 should have less cost than U1 and U2 separately. The cost of U1, U2 should be less than cost of U1. 
plus cost of u2 something like that that your cost function has to satisfy and uh, yeah yeah you want to satisfy a triangle inequality which i guess is what you uh, just outlined and you want it to be homogeneous so like if uh, you multiply i guess the generator by some lambda right like you want everything to change homogeneously in lambda and uh, maybe you want to add like one more condition but i think that's about it okay so basically yeah. these are the norms that satisfy this kind of Thanks. I mean, I, I think like any norm, I mean, that's basically the definition of the norm. So any norm will satisfy it. And then, and then there are uh, infinitely many norms that you can consider. Um, so anyway, uh, I mean, like that's uh, roughly speaking the picture and it's going to be relevant later on. So I wanted to introduce it. And uh, this picture originates from a paper uh, by Nielsen in 2005. Uh, it's discussed in the simple example in the paper by Brown and Saskin that is a uh, pleasure to read. However, the important thing is that uh, you can implement these ideas uh, in three uh, quantum field theories, in particular three control field theories. And when you do this, uh, it turns out that you're going to reproduce static properties of, uh, you're going to be able to reproduce static properties of uh, complexity equals to volume proposal. Uh, it turns out that there are also two other uh, complexity proposals, complexity equals to action and complexity equals to volume point two. And it turns out that you can reproduce static properties of all of them uh, using that sort of considerations in three quantum field theories. And uh, if you want to learn a bit more about it, I will be happy to tell you, but then please ask towards the end of the talk because the, the rest of the talk is not going to be about three quantum field theories. Okay. So, uh, so this was the picture in which, you know, like you really um, have the idea that you start with something, you end with something, and then uh, you more or less know, uh, actually you do know what kind of transformations you uh, do in between, uh, and you optimize over these transformations according to some cost function and uh, you get what you get. Uh, however, um, actually earlier than this works on the complexity in uh, quantum field theory based on um, assigning norms to circuits, uh, there's been a very nice proposal, actually the proposal that I uh, really liked a lot and that uh, stimulated a lot of development in the field, uh, including uh, many of my papers and the one that I'm talking about today. And that goes on the name of tantric optimization. It was devised in March 2017 by the Kyoto Group. Um, and the idea is uh, the following. So from this moment onwards, I'm talking exclusively about two-dimensional uh, conformal field theories. Um, Suppose that you are interested uh, in preparing uh, a thermal density matrix uh, in your conformal field theory, okay? Um, and one reason to be interested in thermal density matrix uh, from the point of view of state preparation is that if you're considering a conformal field theory on a circle and um, you uh, take uh, beta to be going to infinity, then uh, this density matrix acts as a projector of the vacuum state, right? So uh, you might think that uh, if you are able to uh, produce a thermal density matrix, then in particular, uh, by taking beta to be very large, uh, you're also able to produce the vacuum state, right? That, that's roughly speaking the spirit in which I want to talk about it. So anyway, um, in uh, conformal field theories, uh, what these folks noticed, uh, virus scalings act as redundancies, right? So uh, if you were to consider the, the matrix elements of, of, of this operator uh, in the patent integral formulation, you would be able to obtain them by considering a patent integral on a flat uh, Euclidean space uh, in which the matrix elements are defined at t equals zero and t equal beta, where t is the Euclidean time, right? And now, um, it turns out that um, up to normalization of the density matrix, um, the same outcome of the pattern integral is obtained uh, if you were to deform this geometry of a plane by a vial factor with the conditions that uh, this omega in the vial factor vanishes at t equals zero and vanishes at t equal beta, right? So basically, um, I would say any, but perhaps one has to be one has to be a bit more uh, careful because maybe one wants to avoid some singularities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, the, the the spirit is that you, there there's a infinitely many traces of omega that satisfy these boundary conditions, and they provide for you a one fu one functional uh, parameter family of uh, ways of uh, 
preparing the thermal density matrix, right? Um, the, and the only thing that changes is the normalization, and normalization is a, you might say, is a trivial thing to fix, right? Um, so what these folks thought is that um, it's a perfect arena for, for complexity, right? Because uh, we have a redundancy of uh, performing the same task, right? And now we would have to come up with a cost function um, and optimize this cost function with respect to the parameter in the problem, and the parameter in this problem is this function omega of t and x, okay? And uh, their proposal uh, is uh, to consider as a cost the legal action, and the legal action basically is a logarithm of the change of the normalization of uh, the density matrix uh, when you do this value scaling. The legal action is, uh, is, is given by uh, the kinetic term uh, in omega, and a potential term that is like e to the 2 omega. In order to add the kinetic term to the potential term, you have to introduce a scale. And since we are in conformal field theory, the only place where the scale can come from is the UV cutoff. Okay. So what these folks uh, what these folks said uh, is that um, uh, if you want to find the, the least complicated, the least complex way of uh, specifying the thermal density matrix, what you have to do is you have to solve the classical equations of motion for the Liouville action uh, su subject to boundary conditions that at t equals zero, omega goes to zero, and at t equals beta, omega goes to, to zero, right? Once you do this, you're going to get like the optimal geometry, I mean, you're going to get a geometry in which uh, performing the pattern integral is optimal in some sense. So this makes me made me thinking um, because you know like it's, it's an basically it's an alternative uh, prescription for complexity, um, which uh, you know is is kind of puzzling uh, if we have like many different approaches uh, to the same problem that are uh, in principle inequivalent to each other, right? Uh, then there's a question like which one is is better, which one is worse, um, and one thing that this approach um, has built in that uh, myself I like very much is that it's basically based on geometric deformations of conformal field theories. So something that uh, has a very natural interpretation on the gravity side of ADSCT correspondence, right? Because putting a theory on a, I mean, this introducing this Y factor is nothing else than putting a theory on a curve geometry. And in ADSCT correspondence, this curve geometry becomes nothing else than the geometry of the asymptotic boundary, right? So it's something that um, you know if you are if you are able to um, you know understand fully, then it might provide for you a gateway uh, to understand holographic complexity proposals, and and this is why I like it a lot. So uh, when thinking about it uh, in 2018, we actually uh, after two years of thinking about it in 2018, we we realized that uh, one should regard uh, this idea not as a standalone idea, but rather uh, as a subset of these ideas on, um, on gate counting uh, according you in, in, uh, in quantum mechanical systems uh, using various norms. So basically the story is that uh, when you think about putting your quantum field theory in a curved geometry, you can think of it as uh, inserting a stress tensor under the patent integral, right? So if you just consider the, the, the particle on a flat geometry that corresponds basically just to uh, Hamiltonian time evolution. Uh, so this means that uh, the operator that uh, you involve in such a construction is an exponent of the, of the energy density. Um, so it's like time evolution, so it's a Hermitian operator. And because you also do, uh, you know, you, you do some rescaling, uh, you're also actually using uh, gates that are unitary and these gates um, are uh, correspond to using uh, the other component of the stress tensor. So now uh, there is a way of uh, of counting insertions of the stress tensor in this procedure, and it's it's a bit more involved. So I'm not going to go into this in such a way that uh, there is a well-defined cost function that if you expand in the UV cutoff, so if you expand in this delta, you do get the Liouville action. And uh, as a result, uh, you know, like in this way, you um, are able to assign uh, a bona fide complexity in the sense that I discussed here uh, to path integrals um, defined in curved geometry. So I think overall uh, this is uh, this is a, a nice uh, way uh, to move forward. 
so um, this this finishes the introduction. I promise to you that uh, I'm going to accelerate because I have to introduce uh, many, many things. Uh, if you have uh, any questions about this part, uh, maybe you can ask them now. Okay, so if there are no questions, let me move to the uh, main part of my talk. So space time is a quantum circuit. So that's basically introduction to the main part of the talk. So uh, from this moment onwards, uh, I'm just gonna, yeah, sorry, there's a question. Sorry, does somebody have a question? Ask a norm. Maybe it's uh, something that you already met. Oh, sorry, I can I can uh, barely hear. Can can you write it in the chat, maybe? Please. Oh, okay. Sorry. Thanks. Um, yeah, so the, the thing is that uh, that was precisely the thing that we had like a very hard time showing and we failed to show. So we could not see the legal action as uh, originating from any sort of norm in, a, in the exact form. However, we were able to see it emerging as a, a serious expansion of a well-defined norm, albeit exotic norm, in um, the uh, product of the UV cutoff and derivative of omega. So I don't know if believable action is, is, is not a norm, um, but to the best of my uh, current understanding, uh, uh, it arises as a, as, a, as a limit of a well-defined norm. Okay, <laughs> good, sorry. Okay, uh, so if there are no further questions, let me let me move on. So uh, from this moment on, uh, we are Euclidean, so we forget about this uh, nice unitary exercise that I told you about. Um, and uh, we're going back to holography, right? So um, so we consider uh, half of uh, AD, Euclidean ADS3 spacetime, and one can think about half of uh, Euclidean ADS spacetime as e to the minus beta h acting on something and yeah, and this is something, uh, let's not be very specific about it because it's, uh, I'm going to be more specific about things later on. And uh, when you, sorry, when you consider such a thing, uh, such an object that basically prepares for you a normalized vacuum state uh, in a, a two-dimensional conformal field theory. Um, so this is a state preparation uh, in, uh, in the underlying conformal field theory using uh, conformal field theory operators, in this case, using just Euclidean uh, Hamiltonian time evolution in Euclidean time. In 2018, uh, Tadashi Takayanagi uh, had a very nice idea, idea that I liked a lot, in which he said, okay, um, if we want to think about, uh, you know, this, uh, constant time size as a tensor network, so as a, some sort of a circuit, perhaps not a unitary circuit, then maybe, and, and if, if one can think about the boundary as also defining a circuit, maybe also some intermediate uh, bulk uh, slices, so co-dimensional one surfaces in the bulk, uh, also give rise to circuits, right? So, from this perspective, you know, like that might be like one way of preparing the vacuum state. That might be the other way of preparing the vacuum state. That might be like yet the third way of preparing the vacuum state. And maybe you can, you know, push it all the way so that you prepare the vacuum state by considering something that is defined on this uh, orange uh, maximum volume, or in this case, minimum volume slice. And uh, if you if you say that the the volume of each of such co-dimensional one surfaces is the relevant quantity to consider then I believe that this one is gonna be the one that minimizes the volume, right? So, so that's the idea by, um, by, by Tadashi. And uh, when one sees this from this perspective, you know, um, H2 uh, is, so this, this geometry of the minimal or maximal volume uh, time slice is just one example of a circuit that perhaps optimizes some cost function. 
So uh, one thing that one should say is that like these statements that were made in this paper were statements that were made in the context of conformal field theories, and as we will see, one has to be uh, one has to go beyond conformal field theories in order to to make such a thing uh, work. Um, so the other thing that was very nice about the pathological optimization is that uh, if you consider this cost function, you take the limit beta, beta going to infinity, and you, you do the optimization, then the optimal solution that you get basically is a hyperbolic disk. Um, so the pathological optimization uh, gives rise to a hyperbolic disk as a result of you know, uh, manipulations that you do. And this led uh, superficially to a claim that actually, you know, you, you take the legal action, you optimize it, and it gives rise to this uh, geometry of a hyperbolic disk on a maximal or minimal uh, volume uh, time slice. And we call it a day and claim a success. So it turns out that, this, I mean, as, as beautiful as it is, uh, it turns out that the story is more subtle than this. And this is basically what motivated us to, to rethink it a bit. And to this end, uh, there are actually infinitely many hyperbolic disks that are uh, encoded in a Euclidean ADS3 geometry. In particular, we can foliate Euclidean ADS geometry by slices um, of, uh, say, a radial variable such that each of these slices is a hyperbolic disk. So from this perspective, you can ask, okay, I mean, which of these hyperbolic disks would correspond to the minimum of the legal action? Furthermore, uh, the way I write legal action uh, is such that to make it apparent that one should think of it as a derivative expansion in the UV cutoff and just keeping the two uh, leading terms in such a derivative expansion. So this term uh, normally is a term that renormalizes the expectation value of the stress tensor. And this term is the term that normally is responsible for the trace anomaly of the stress tensor, right? But then there are terms that's going to scale like uh, delta squared, uh, partial omega to the fourth, and so on and so forth, that you neglect because in the limit in which you approach continuum quantum field theory, um, these terms drop away because the cut of delta going to zero. Um, of course, uh, when you do things in holography, typically what you do is you introduce holographic counter terms, and these holographic counter terms uh, cancel uh, this contribution, and then you're just left with uh, the, the, the anomaly action that gives rise to the uh, trace anomaly. Now, uh, if you just take the legal action blindly and do the optimization, so do variations over omega, what turns out, and this is kind of obvious to see, uh, from uh, this action is that this set variations of omega on the scale of the UV cutoff. And as a result, if there are higher terms in the action uh, with higher powers of delta, um, these terms in principle uh, contribute as order one contributions uh, to, uh, to, to the action, despite the fact that normally, I mean, in order to, to truncate the action, we neglected them, right? So what I'm saying is that um, unless there is something super special about the legal action, uh, you know, uh, optimizing it and uh, calling it a day uh, is inconsistent with the underlying idea of the gradient expansion. And all these things together uh, provide a strong motivation to go beyond the legal action. And because over here I'm talking about uh, keeping terms uh, you know, to all orders in the UV cut of expansion. And this means that we have, we have to basically give up the idea of doing things in a continuum conformal field theory. We have to do something else. And uh, this something else is actually very natural to consider uh, because we know uh, by now from a pioneering work in 2016 by Mago, Maze, and Ferlinda that if one considers a gravitational partition function, um, but not uh, in ADS3 geometry, you see an ADS3 geometry with the asymptotic boundary, but with boundary conditions set uh, in some uh, finite region, then this corresponds to calculating the partition function not in the original CFT, but in a theory that uh, arises as a TT bar deformation of the CFT. So basically from the point of view of, uh, of, of holography, you might think that you know this is the partition function that you calculate. Draw corresponds to basically the radial coordinate in ADS. If you take a derivative of the partition function with respect to rho, then the answer is given by basically the square of the Brown-York uh, stress tensor at the fixed cutoff, right? 
So this defines for you RT equation that you can integrate in 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 raw, and uh, as a result, it defines for you uh, what is meant uh, by a t t bar deformed uh, theory that you consider. Now, this is what Mako, Mazzei, and Ferlinda did. But now to bring it in uh, to our situation, so imagine that uh, we come back to this idea that I just discussed before, that we have a constant time set in Euclidean ADS spacetime. This is the asymptotic boundary. This defines for us a circuit that involves the stress that just Hamiltonian evolution, Euclidean Hamiltonian evolution in quantum field theory. This defines for us other circuit, other circuit, and so on and so forth. So because uh, these uh, new boundaries, uh, moving the boundary inwards, uh, you know, uh, is corresponds to to turning on a TT bar deformation, and in particular, turning on a finite TT bar deformation. That means that when we talk about such circuits, we're not really talking about the circuits in the, the defined directly in the original CFT, but actually circuits defined in an effective field theory that arises from irrelevant deformation of the CFT by the square of the stress center operator, right? So uh, what we did in our paper uh, from January this year uh, was to put together these ideas, that is going beyond the legal action, and also looking at uh, TT bar deformations and being careful, to some degree careful about it, and also looking at kinematic space together to try to understand um, if um, thinking about uh, uh, basically non-asymptotic uh, boundaries in ADS3 spacetime makes sense from the point of view of talking about circuits. And if we can, if one can indeed think about uh, the minimal or maximal volume slice as um, defining uh, some circuit of a sort. So, so this is this is basically what we are after. So, are there any questions to 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 the part that I just talked about? Okay, so let me proceed. Um, so, so now I, I, will, I will accelerate even more because uh, the, now things uh, should be a bit more clear. So uh, what I'm gonna consider in the following is the Poincare patch of Euclidean ADS3 given by this geometry. And whatever pictures I will be displaying will be the pictures in which I uh, truncate the X direction. So they're gonna be pictures in Z and T direction. And the situation that I'll be considering is a situation in which uh, we have initial time and we have a final time, so uh, Ti and Tf. And on the initial time, we start uh, with uh, ADS cut at some radial position Zi, and we finish with ADS cut at some radial position Zf. Uh, in particular, ZF can be taken to zero or very close to zero, in which case we are going to be considering a state uh, in the underlying conformal field theory. If ZF is non-zero, then uh, this state uh, is a state uh, in uh, a TT bar deformed theory, so to be understood. So basically what we're going to be considering is we're going to be considering um, uh, parts of the bulk geometry that are uh, denoted by, by this M and the dashed region that interpolate between initial and final time slices in which the radial cutoff in the ADS is set at, in principle, two different values, right? And such, we're going to neglect uh, the ex-dependence of, uh, you know, such, uh, such boundaries, and we're just going to be looking at, uh, at Z as a function of T, so Euclidean time, so we're going to denote this function as rho of T. So our claim uh, is going to be that each choice of rho of each choice of uh, rho of T defines for us uh, a, in principle different circuit that interpolate between um, initial state and the final state, both of which are vacua in TT bar deformed theories possibly with a different value of the TT bar uh, coupling. And such circuits uh, certainly involve Euclidean time evolution, right? Because the, the time uh, is changing here in general, right? Like it's, it's growing from T initial to T final. 
as well as they involve coarse graining, right? Because uh, in principle, ZF and Z, Z initial and Z final uh, in principle can be different, right? And um, so this is the setup. And our proposal uh, is that the cost of this task, so the cost of preparing the state with a cut of ZF from the state with a cut of ZI using uh, whatever uh, gravity makes available to us in quantum field theory is given by the bulk action evaluated in the, in the, in the region M, in the gray region M. So this bulk gravitational action is just eichen hilbert term, cosmological constant. Then there is a, um, there is a extrinsic curvature term uh, on the boundary. And then there is, uh, there is also a possibility of including counter terms. So in particular, these counter terms that we're gonna be interested in are gonna be the, the joint terms that uh, reside uh, here. And what I want to emphasize is that in this talk, at least, uh, I'm not gonna consider a volume counter term uh, defined here. The reason being that the level action has this divergent piece, UV divergent piece, and uh, in order to be able to reproduce it, I have to neglect the volume counter term that normally, uh, say, Costa Scandari et al. would insist on uh, including. I don't want to do this. So after the dust settles, uh, the action uh, takes uh, this form. So this is the, the bulk gravitational action evaluated as a functional of rho of t that defines for us um, a boundary that is not asymptotic. Um, the, it, it, it can be, you know, it has a second derivative with respect to uh, T of rho. You can try to integrate it by parts. And then what you get is a, is a relatively simple structure. It's like one over rho squared, uh, rho dot r plus tangent uh, rho dot over rho squared, plus uh, some additional uh, things appearing. Um, and when, when you stare at this, at this particular contribution, you can regard this particular contribution as a generalization of the level action to all order in the UV cutoff. And to see it, what you need to do is you need to write that rho is the cutoff times e to the omega. And when you series expand this in delta, what you're going to see is that, well, I mean, there's a kinetic term, there's a potential term, and then there are contributions that go like higher powers of delta. And actually over here, that should be like the fourth power of partial omega, uh, sorry for the typo, right? So what I'm trying to say is that unsurprisingly, uh, the gravitational action that we consider um, provides uh, a, and reduces to the level action uh, when uh, the surface hovers in the asymptotic region, but otherwise uh, is a generally nonlinear optimization problem that uh, if you treat it as a cost function, it's gonna define for you uh, you know, some optimal choice for rho of t, uh, if you like it or not. So, so this is our proposal, it's relatively simple. And um, in order to optimize it, uh, we're gonna proceed in two stages. So there's a two-stage optimization procedure. So, um, you know, what we take as a, as a reference state, what we take as a target state is something that we fix beforehand, right? So in our case, what we fix is the initial cutoff, final cutoff, as well as we fix uh, the time duration, right? Um, we're gonna keep like this initially, at least like this delta T uh, fix, and we're gonna op minimize the action. So we're gonna minimize this, this functional with respect to uh, rho as a function of T. So these are the equations of motion that you get. And when you look at the solution, it turns out that the solutions are nothing else than a portions of a circle. Um, so this circle is parameterized by, say, uh, you know, the center of the circle and the radius of the circle. So there are two, uh, there are two integration constants, and these two integration constants are fit in by the value of ZF, ZI, TI, and TF, right? So you, you can do the math. Uh, when you evaluate the action on this solution, uh, this is what you get that depends on the uh, Z, Z initial, so initial cutoff, final cutoff, as well as time duration. But now what we want to do as a second step optimization is we also want to optimize over the time duration of the whole procedure. And once you do this, what you're going to do, what you're going to get is that um, this cutoff basically aligns itself not 
you know, parallel to the asymptotic boundary, but actually perpendicular to the asymptotic boundary. And basically, it interpolates between the state defined at, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the, the surface that we are after, the, the surface that defines the circuit, um, aligns itself perpendicular to the asymptotic boundary and interpolates between state, the vacuum at the initial cutoff and the vacuum at the final cutoff without invoking any Euclidean time evolution at all. And this surface is denoted here by uh, orange, and it is so because it's nothing else than a part of this minimal or maximum volume uh, time slice that was used to define uh, holographic complexity proposal, right? So to recap, like we, we propose that the gravitational action in this region um, is uh, the quantity to consider uh, to, to optimize uh, as a cost function for uh, rho of t with the idea that this rho of t defines for us some circuit. And when you run down the crank, uh, it turns out that uh, the optimal circuit uh, according uh, to this criterion is the one that aligns itself along the, 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 the complexity equals to volume uh, time slice. So this is basically a victory because you can regard it as a derivation of uh, complexity equal to volume proposal uh, with the input assumption being that the, the correct cost function to consider uh, is the gravitational action in ADS. So something that is very natural quantity to, to look. And moreover, um, when you consider a holographic complexity proposal, uh, the volume proposal does not really come with the fixed prefactor. And the action, of course, uh, it does have a fixed prefactor, right? Uh, it's one over 16 pi d newton that translates into the central charge in the underlying uh, conformal field theory. So actually, if you derive the volume proposal in this way, uh, you actually do get the prefactor uh, in front of the volume of the initial uh, of the of the of the part of the of the maximum volume or minimum volume time slice. And of course, Michal, you can I take a little bit fast. So can I ask something? Uh, so, of course. So you 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 are optimizing over this z is equal to rho t, but then how you are you are not op optimizing over the uh, the yellow, whatever, the final slice. So I, I lost something in between. So you're choosing your time slice. So what do you mean by the resulting circuit aligns around CV slice? Good, 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 good. Between. Good. So, so I do two stage optimization. So I'm saying, okay, I mean, over here uh, in the setup, I, I pick some initial slice, I pick some final slice, slice, right? On each slice, I pick a state, right? Yeah, yeah. And consider all the all the non-asymptotic boundaries that interpolate between the two, right? Mm -hmm. But now I say, okay, I mean, in the end, I'm just interested in circuits that interpolate between states. So nobody really told me what's supposed to be a time duration for the circuits, right? So the time duration uh, that I consider should be also a free parameter. So it should be also something that I optimize over. So what 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 we do? Sorry, uh, yeah. What what we do is uh, we have this this two stage optimization process in which we first, for a fixed value of initial and final time, we find uh, the optimal non asymptotic boundary, mm -hmm. and then for for each choice of the time duration, we and we look how how the value of the action changes as we vary the time duration. And we see that it's minimal as the time duration approaches zero. And as time duration approaches zero, you know, like basically there is no space time left, basically, right? And the contribution that you get um, is probably only the contribution coming from boundary terms. Mm. Uh, nevertheless, this is the contribution that uh, gives rise to the minimal action. Mm -hmm. And, and, and this, is some, this is a circuit that does not involve any uh, time evolution, Euclidean time evolution. It just involves coarse graining. I see. Ah, okay. So your claim is that uh, uh, you are able to, uh, in the, in the, when, when, after you optimize the path, you are able to recover this uh, this, this, uh, see, uh, 
the the CV, CV slice uh, volume or the action? The volume. Uh, I'm, I'm here. I'm exclusive. I'm, I'm using the action, but the exclusive thing that I'm interested in is the volume proposal. Are uh, the volume when proposal you're able to? I'm using. I'm using the action as a cost function that gives rise to the volume proposal. Okay, and the final answer is like this, which is I get it exactly, uh, okay. exactly, exactly. So and now, now, mean the complexity of the individual uh, things that you get by the individually applying the volume proposal to each of this factor. Exactly. So now, if you were to apply, I mean, this this is basically the difference in volumes for for this one and and this one, right? The max the maximum volumes, right? And if you take the limit in which that i goes to infinity, whatever it really means, then you recover the volume, and, and you take the limit in which that f uh, goes to asymptotic boundary, so to zero, then you recover the result of uh, complexity equals volume for the vacuum in a conformal field theory. That's so the idea. Can, okay, thank you. But now I understand, but I have a little puzzle here. Maybe uh, you can, uh, so you go from say one vacuum to another vacuum. So say vacuum one, vacuum two, vacuum three. Uh, yeah. So so if I go from one to two, uh, two, you have some complexity. Then I go to two to three, I will have some complexity. And by the formula, uh, the is one to two plus two, two to three is the same as the complexity from one to three, right? By this formula. Uh, that I would say, let's see. Uh, yeah, because you have simply the subtraction of uh, one over ZF minus one over ZI. But this is this is yeah this is the complexity yes 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 yeah. right but this is a little bit strange right you would expect somehow it's uh, I mean it's consistent perhaps but uh, uh, if you the the number of gates that you can go say one to two and then number of gates from two to three then if you directly go from one to three you would uh, probably will be able to do it lesser number of gates right without going via two say I mean it it, it must be the property of uh, this particular circuit and this particular cost that uh, we yeah. use that uh, gives rise to this. Uh, but for for other costs, like uh, I would uh, view a view uh, that uh, it might happen differently, right? Like, but you know, like this construction is such that uh, the intermediate states here that you consider on the way are states that are uh, just vacua. I mean, like basically. Because your circuits are defined by the bulk, and the bulk is just uh, empty Euclidean AVS tree, uh, every point in the along the circuit uh, corresponds to the vacuum, right? Mm -hmm. So you basically you have no choice. I mean, like uh, the only thing that uh, you can get rid of in this picture is Euclidean time evolution, and it turns out that uh, this cost function that we define. Uh, is such that uh, it's uh, necessary to get rid of Euclidean time evolution to get uh, uh, the, the the optimal circuit, right? It's more like a berry phase like evolution because it's like difference between two phases or something because then it will indeed add up as, I don't know. So it seems like because so, in, you, know, you, are, you are doing some adiabatic evolution on the space of vacua, that's why this cost comes out to be of this nice property. That, or, no, that, 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 special property, okay. That, that's a that's a very nice comment actually because uh, it turns out that uh, well I'm mean, like uh, the 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 legal action or actually yeah the, the legal action you can think of as a geometric action and uh, such geometric actions arise as very phases so over here uh, it's plausible that whatever we're talking about uh, is uh, related to some Euclidianized uh, Berry phase, right? So, you know, normally you think about the Berry phase as a U1 phase, right? Because here we are doing Euclidean, uh, it's not going to be, you know, like a, a U1 phase, it's going to be actually e to the minus, you know, some, some real number, say. Uh, so we're talking about this number under the exponent. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I think I'm with you in this, in this uh, interpretation, although I'm not sure uh, I mean, I'm not sure if, if if I can confirm or rule it out, or it's going to be just you know one of the inter one of the possible interpretations. More more work needs to be done. Okay, thanks, thanks. Okay, um, so good. So so this is basically the idea for the circuit. So, so let's think about it from. So I, I'm almost done. Uh, I just have uh, three more slides. Um, so let's think about it from the point of view of gate counting. So. Uh, a natural circuit that you might expect uh, writing is a circuit that you know, like one starts with the reference state that is here, one gets the target state that is here, 
and one does it through re repetitions of Euclidean time evolution with a Hamiltonian that is not a CFT Hamiltonian, but it's a Hamiltonian in a coarse grain uh, theory. And then if you change the cutoff here, um, this, uh, the change in the cutoff must be associated with the insertion of this TT bar, uh, so the square of the stress net or uh, the formation. Uh, so like that, that's how we want to view uh, the circuit. And now um, one can introduce a straightforward cost function. So if one likes L1 norms, then the number of insertions of uh, you know the the gate corresponding to the Hamiltonian time Euclidean time evolution is proportional you know like to dt right so like dt is the you know is is about how much we we evolved in in Euclidean time and then we can multiply it in principle by some function of rho because rho is nothing else than uh, just a trivial label and now. For, for this part, uh, we, the number of times we, insert, we, we perform this coarse graining is going to be proportional to not to dt, but now rho dot times dt. And it probably shouldn't matter if rho dot is positive or negative. So what we're going to do is we're going to put an absolute value here. And this guy, uh, in principle, should be multiplied by some function of rho. OK? So, if one were to define a complexity based on an L1 norm, what one would do is one would optimize over rho of t and also delta t, so similarly to the way we did with the action. And now what we have to, inter what we have to integrate between the final and uh, the, the initial and final point is basically dt that uh, corresponds to this contribution and um, rho dot absolute value dt that corresponds to this contribution, right? And now if you were to optimize this, you would get something like ZF minus ZI, which would be uh, your, uh, your cost function, or maybe like absolute value of this actually. Um, so that's like just a sample consideration. You can consider things that have uh, some uh, non-negative functions of raw in front here and there. You can, consider, you can also consider L2 norms, or you, know, you can consider basically any norm that uh, makes sense and uh, see what you get. However, if you proceed in this way, uh, it's going to be actually difficult to explain the term appearing in the action, uh, which is this term, okay? Uh, because this term actually uh, is a term that, uh, you know, like it has like this, this raw dot that appears in front of the coarse graining operation, but it also has like this arcus tangent of raw dots that does not appear here and that correspond basically to a rotation uh, of of the surface as it uh, you know evolves in time. So it's 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 something that 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 is you know like it's 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 uh, hard to conceive uh, from from this sort of an argument. And indeed, if one thinks about the action as having to do with a very phase, then maybe uh, one might be able to 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 derive it from this perspective. Uh, but uh, in the last part of my talk, uh, we want to uh, give uh, a different uh, handle on this, on, on, this, on this functional, and this is going to occur from the kinematic space. So, um, so as I said, like the circuit is being defined as uh, raw of t. So raw of t is some bulk object defined in the bulk that defines for us a family of uh, quantum field theories with a cutoff that correspond to a finite t bar deformations of CFTs. But now we want to view this rho of t as seen from the original CFT living on the asymptotic boundary. And uh, as we know from um, you know, studies of entanglement entropy, in this particular case, we can just use Ryuta Kanagi surfaces to uh, define this uh, variable cutoff surface rho of t, right? So for example, like let, let's pick a value of of, of time variable t, there is an x direction here, perpendicular to the screen. Um, and in this x direction, we can consider a Ryuta Kangi surface such that it touches uh, this uh, rho of t precisely where it is, right? And such a Ryuta Kangi surface is going to be defined by the endpoints. For example, uh, one endpoint is going to be minus rho of t, the other one is going to be at plus rho of t, right? 
So that's going to be the, 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 the semicircle defining root Takanagi surface that extends in the x direction and touches rho of t uh, over here on this, on this time slice. Okay? So that's one possibility. And one can be more imaginative. Uh, I'm going to call it exotic root Takanagi, right? So normally you want, you know, like you define root Takanagi along the constant uh, time slice. Here we are Euclidean. So it's a bit up to us to define what we mean by time, what we mean by space. So now we can regard, say, x direction that is perpendicular to the screen as, as a space direction for root Takanagi, for, as a time direction for root Takanagi surfaces, Euclidean time direction. So now we're going to consider uh, root Takanagi surfaces that are tangent to this row of t. And they're going to be also defined by two endpoints. Uh, these endpoints now are going to be t1 and t2 of t. And it turns out that the formula that expresses the position of these endpoints in terms of this cutoff surface is given uh, by this equation. So it's a more complicated formula. And as I said earlier, the kinematic space, so basically a space of such circles, either uh, extending along the uh, t direction uh, for constant x or for constant t along the x direction, uh, is a metric that uh, is a decider metric uh, that comes with this or uh, that uh, form, right? So like here, this is relevant for the first case. This is relevant for the second case. So now, if you take the if you take the the, the line element or like the, the the distance element, so if you take the distance in kinematic space that you travel as t varies, and um, and integrate it over, and actually this, this integral should be exchanged, sorry for the typo, and integrate over all t, then it turns out that uh, if you use uh, this scenario uh, to define a cost, you're going to define a cost that looks like an L1 cost. So it looks uh, very similar to this thing here. But now the penalty factor in front of dt is zero. So there is no cost assigned to uh, the motion in T, but the cost assigned to the motion in rho is inversely proportional to rho, sorry. So, so over here is like one over rho squared and this is permitted. So this is what originates from the kinematic, from basically the original kinematic space construction. However, if you take an alternative kinematic space construction in which you use these, um, these cyan, uh, exotic root Takanagi surfaces and you play the same game that is the you use the distance on the kinematic space to define for you uh, you know the cost function then it turns out that you get an expression that looks basically the same as an expression uh, for uh, the bulk uh, action density right so our starting point for uh, consideration of the cost function uh, I said basically the same uh, because there is here an absolute value, and uh, you should deal with it uh, if you want to say that it's precisely uh, the action and nothing else. So the partial from these considerations is that actually kinematic space uh, in this sort of consideration of circuits that depend only on t, not on x, uh, provide us with um, an alternative method of coming up with cost functions. Uh, these cost functions look a lot look a lot like L1 cost functions. One of them um, uh, is like a simple one that is easy to conceive. The other one is a rather non-trivial one that uh, looks uh, very much like uh, the action. So uh, let me summarize. Um, so when holographic entanglement entropy was born in 2006 by Yuen Takanagi. Um, uh, people could refer, in particular, Arjuna Takinagi referred to universal results and universal tools in two-dimensional Kofara field theories to corroborate it and later to derive it. And when I say derive it, I mean the paper by Lefkowitz and Malasena in 2013. Now, with the idea that holographic complexity appeared for the first time around 2013, uh, 2014, uh, eight years after we introduced it, Quantitatively, not qualitatively, but quantitatively, we are not much farther than what for entanglement entropy has been the area law of entanglement entropy, right? So the universality of how entanglement entropy diverges with the UV cutoff in quantum field theory. 
so whatever I have to tell you is based uh, on an idea that I find particularly powerful uh, that ultimately probably goes back to Tadashi Takenagi, that codimension one volumes in the bulk, uh, so you can access your codimension two, here I talk about codimension one volumes in the bulk, define circuits. Um, and uh, what I try to do is I try to take this idea and try to, um, you know, elaborate on it and try to see what are the subtleties in this idea and like if one can use this idea to derive like one of the holographic complexity proposals. So in our work, we made this idea a bit more precise uh, by realizing that the circuits that one needs to consider are not the circuits that are directly defined in the online CFT, but actually these are circuits that are defined in a TT bar deformation of a CFT. Uh, we had our own proposal uh, for the cost function that was the bulk action. And this proposal was able to reproduce the complexity equal to volume uh, in the case of empty ADS space time. And uh, moreover, we made a connection with the kinematic space uh, program that uh, is able to, to, to reproduce uh, features of what we took as natural cost functions. So that's all that uh, I had to say. And sorry for running uh, a bit late. I think I'm 15 minutes over time. Sorry. No, it was quite good. Thank you very much for this nice talk. Let's have a nice clap. And uh, hope there are more questions now. Uh, it's pretty late <laughs> here, and uh, we have three talks actually today. Two more talks, <laughs> so um, perhaps there won't be more question. All is fine. So yeah, it was quite interesting, uh, uh, but I don't know whether I uh, I have any further question. Also, uh, it, uh, at this point, uh, maybe a simple question that I can ask is. Uh, I have seen that people have uh, tried to compute the complexity of uh, some kind of conformal transformation itself in some of this, uh, and there is some way in a conformal field theory to do that. Uh, so would you be able to derive this kind of uh, proposals, complexity is equal to volume in that context? Uh, instead well, that, that, of if I do some conformal transformation on the boundary, no, that, that, that's a very good point. So uh, we've had uh, several, we had like uh, two papers on, on this topic with Maria Flory, uh, who's been in the audience. Uh, and earlier, there were uh, papers on this uh, by, by Maria and collaborators uh, in the context of uh, holographic complexity proposals. And there was also a very interesting work by Paul Saputa and Javier Magan. Um, and I think there, the important thing to note is that um, when one starts with, say, the vacuum in a, when one takes as a reference state the vacuum in a, a conformal field theory and one goes to a state that is related by a local diffeomorphism, by a local transformation, then one does not really alter the UV, the UV part of your conformal field theory, right? Like these are uh, really things that alter infrared. And as a result, like you expect uh, without doing any calculation that uh, whatever complexity uh, notion you're going to come with, uh, the answer is going to be UV finite, right? Um, so should, okay, yeah. Of so course. UV finite, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, when you look at the existing holographic complexity proposals, uh, at least like the volume one, um, if you want to anchor the volumes on the asymptotic boundary, then uh, and you, you're after the volume, um, then uh, you're going to get something that diverges, right? Because of the, uh, yeah. uh, the asymptotic nature of the, of the, of the boundary in ADS. Um, so in order, to, in order to get something you define that you have to do a bit better. Um, so recently, I think about a week or maybe two weeks ago, I don't remember exactly, there was a paper that uh, I think the context of thermal for double states, so slightly different context, was looking at the other complexity proposal, which is the action proposal. And I think, like in this paper, they um, they had a way uh, of uh, tweaking the proposal in such a way that one gets rid of the divergent contribution. So um, I mean, I, I I don't know this paper uh, particularly well at this point. I still have to look at this in in more detail. So 
that seems, I mean, at least for now, like that seems to me to be like one way of getting uh, the answer that uh, that is uh, UV uh, finite. Mm -hmm. um, you might think about the other ways of, of, of getting the answer that UV finite and uh, with Maria and uh, collaborators, we are looking into such things, but it's, it's, not, it's not particularly easy actually. Okay, thank you very much. Sure, sure. No, it's a, it's a great question. Okay, so thanks for the nice talk again, and uh, hope to see you back again in on our channel at some other point of time. And yeah, uh, thanks. Okay, bye. See you later. <laughs> Have a Take nice care, bye -bye. Have a good evening. Bye bye.